This is Health Call Online, the place for extended versions of interviews you hear in our weekly radio broadcast, the Health Call Radio Hour, heard on more stations around the country as they join the Health Call Radio Network. Normally on this program, we focus on feeling your best and aging well, but today we're going to fast forward to the end of our golden years and take a look And what happens is life slips away. You may be surprised to find that some people actually look forward to whatever comes next. We're going to hear about that today from our guest, Hadley Vlahas, a hospice nurse who has written about all of this in her new book called The In-Between, Engaging Encounters During Life's Final Moments. So Hadley, welcome. Many people may know you already, over 2 million followers on TikTok, so you're no stranger to that audience, but kind of new to my group of listeners. Tell us about what this, the title of your book means. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So basically the in-between, since I am a hospice nurse, I'm with people in their final months, hours, days of life. I find that people in the last week or so go in between whatever comes next, the afterlife, I'd say, and our world, almost like they have one foot in each world, and I'm there with them in the in-between. So is it is this a scary time for people or what's your sense of how they're approaching the end of their lives? So people kind of go through phases like when they first come on hospice, sometimes they're a little bit resistant to it, of course, and they might not like it. They might be a little bit scared. And as we move through it and as people get closer to death and as they start to see their deceased loved ones, they usually are very at peace and very calm. Now, you said that just like it's no big deal. They see their deceased loved ones. How common is that? It's very common. And it, 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 that's how I felt whenever I first went into it, whenever all the hospice nurses was like, yeah, this happens all the time. I was like, what in the world? Like, this is not medicine, but it is. And we do see it all the time. Describe that for me. What, what are people telling you they see your experience? Yeah. So usually whenever I arrive, it'll be the caregiver or the spouse who says, you know, they've been talking to someone who's been deceased for a while, or they say that they're seeing them and I'll go in and I'll ask them. And they say it very matter of fact, like, of course, like if I were to say, yes, I'm speaking to Lee right now. Like, can, can you not see Lee? And then they're also talking to me, which I find very interesting, but it's very peaceful. So they're actually seeing that person. They're in the room with them. Yes. Do you ever get a sense of that? Do you ever feel like there's another presence? No, I don't. Isn't that interesting? What are those conversations about? They can be about anything. Sometimes they're catching up. A lot of times they'll tell them that they're going on a trip. I've had a patient say that, you know, um, my mom, who is deceased, told me that I need to get my rest because we're about to go on a long trip. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, we're going to go this weekend. And he he did die that weekend. You know, this is not the first I've heard of that. My brother-in-law is a radiation oncologist who specialized in pediatric oncology and brain cancer. And he said children often report that grandpa is here or something of that nature. But it's I had no idea it was that common. So... uh, is it they come and they go, they're there all the time? Give me a sense of what that experience entails. So I'm not really sure if they come or go because when people are at that point, they're usually sleeping the vast majority of the day, about 20 hours a day on average. So we're only getting to talk to them during those three or four hours a day that they're awake. So I suspect that they stay with them, but I'm not able to talk to them and know the entire time. How do you, are you sure this isn't, many of your patients I'm sure are on medications, painkillers, that type of thing. Are you, are we sure this isn't the effects of the drugs working? I get that question all the time and I totally, totally understand it. So I have patients who see deceased loved ones who never take a single medication other than maybe a Tylenol. Um, I have patients, morphine is the one that the general consensus, people think that that's what it might be. But I have patients who have like COPD who have been on morphine for years who Mm -hmm. have it. We're not increasing their dose. We're just still giving it. Um, And this, I have seen side effects of morphine before that causes hallucinations. And it's 
distressing. It's spiders on the bed. It's a snake on the wall. And these are not distressing or concerning for them. Wow, it's peaceful. They welcome the visit. That's so interesting. Yeah. Is it typically, I hate to keep driving on this, but it's so interesting. Is it more than one relative or is it always kind of just one person who comes along? No, it can be more than one. Wow. Huh. And what do they tell you about the other side? Do they see across to the other side? They usually kind of don't know. They're just like, yeah, um, my mom's here. You know, I've had people whose children who passed before them have come back to get Mm. them. And it's just like they're there in the room. And I try to ask questions, but also try to respect that this is sacred for them and not let my curiosities uh, get in the way of that. I'd love to just ask all the questions, though. (laughs) Oh, I know. I'd be so driven. I'd, I'd, I would have to probe. And is there a religious component to this? Do you see this in you know people who maybe aren't all that spiritual? So when I first heard of this, that is what I thought it was. I was like, okay, these people w- were raised this way, believe this way, and that's what they've been conditioned to think. But no, I've had atheists whose loved ones come to get them, any and all religions and non-religions. It's all the wow. same. Fascinating. Well, I guess we have that in common and that to look forward to. So who is your book really for? It's for anyone who has lost a loved one, especially people who have been through the hospice experience, who have had experiences like this. And they were like, oh, that was kind of weird that, you know, my deceased brother came to get my dad. Um, But you don't think anything of it. And I think that hearing that this does happen to other people can be helpful and may give it meaning. And, you know, anyone who's going through grief or maybe even is scared of death, I think it can really help whenever you really understand that it's not as scary as a lot of people think it is. Yeah, I want to talk more about uh, misconceptions about death. But so, you know, from what I read, your, your book is interesting. It's a collection of stories of your experiences with various patients over the six years you've been a hospice nurse. Help people understand what that role is and how that's different from your training as a nurse. Yeah, it's very different from my training as a nurse. The biggest thing is that we go to people's homes. Um, For some people, their home is in a nursing home or an assisted living, but we go to them. They're not coming to us in a hospital. And it's different. I mean, you can't help but have a different type of relationship with someone when you're meeting their pets and you're surrounded by their memories on their wall and, you know, their families and everything. And it's just, it's different in that regard. And I really like that. And then our goals are different. Our goal is just whatever the patient wants to make them comfortable. And in a lot of instances in healthcare, we really take the lead and we say, this is what we're going to do, or this is what we recommend. And here's the plan. And we take a back seat uh, in hospice and we say, what do you want? What can we do to help you? And I think it's beautiful. So what are the important questions that I need to resolve if I'm facing end of life? I think the biggest things that you can start to think about is what do I want to leave behind? I think a lot of people find themselves thinking that and saying, you know, what do I want my kids to know? What do I want them to remember me by? And whenever people can ask themselves that and then think about it and really relay it, I think it really helps not only the patient, but also the family. Um, Mm -hmm. but in a technical sense, um, having, you know, your end of life wishes in place is so important, you know, advanced care planning and a power of attorney. It, I know it seems so mundane and, oh yeah, I'll do that one day. But I mean, I have end of life wishes in writing. I, it can make or break an experience for family. Do you see patients in, I'm sure across the spectrum, you've seen lots of things, but typically are these patients um, calm and looking forward to the end? Can they, do they, do they have any control over when that moment's going to come? Yeah, it's very interesting. Most people are very calm um, mentally and people do seem to be able to control their death. It's the wildest thing. I always say that We can't choose when we go to sleep at night, but people seem to be able to control their time of death. And Hmm. I see it both ways because I've had people say, well, but why didn't my dad wait? And I find that people who are a little bit more reserved in their personality will actually wait for people to leave. 
so that they are not dying in front of others. And then people who are a little bit more extroverted sometimes will wait until someone arrives. You know, we had exactly that experience. My father-in-law had a stroke and was in hospice care and he was sedated, medicated the whole way through. And we were with him for, somebody was there in vigil, I, I think almost 10 days. And finally the hospice doctor said, you know, he can't let go if you're still here. So isn't that interesting? You confirmed that. It's very that. interesting. It's wow. very interesting. Okay, so um, what, what do people misunderstand about those last moments? A lot of people think that it's very quick. I, I hear that a lot. People think that it's just, oh, okay, you know, the bright light comes and you're gone and it's very yeah. quick. But in reality, like you said, 10 days dying can be kind of a slow process. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we go through all of these stages of it. And hospice is for people with six months or less to live, but we could be less than that. But I've had people for up to a year and the entire process of dying is really about a month before it actually happens it went, is when it starts. What is a sign that death is imminent? For imminent, we'll see people be unconscious. Um, their arms and legs turn blue and their breathing has long pauses between it. So tell me about this surge or the rally experience. Have you seen that happen? Oh yeah, all the time. Describe that for us. Yeah, so usually about a week to a few days beforehand, people will get this surge of energy sometimes. And a lot of times people will think that someone's getting better. And in reality, they will have a little surge of energy and then they will quickly start that next decline process to where they're being, you know, only awake a few hours a day. Um, but some, for some people it's huge and they're all of a sudden out of bed when they've been bed bound for years. And then other people, it might just mean that they want to sit up and eat some ice cream and talk whenever they've really mm. just been too tired to be doing that for many months. Go back a second there. People are up and out of bed and around the house. That's, that's astounding. It is. And that happens in a small percentage of people, but it's crazy to see whenever you see, I had one patient who was bed bound for about a year and, um, I came in one day and he was out of bed and he was, um, actually playing hide and go seek with his deceased daughter who died when she was little. Wow. He's in my book. Does, do you find yourself, does anything scare you anymore? <laughs> You know, I wouldn't say it's ever really scary because I see these patients that, you know, I've gotten to know so well and I trust them and they're not scared. So I say, you know what, they're not scared. I'm not scared. Whatever they are going to is obviously peaceful. And I think that that's great. It's definitely caught me off guard quite a few times, though. You know, I'm I, I'm uncomfortable in those surroundings. It's just it's uneasy. I don't know what to say. Can you help me through that? What do I say to someone who's in those moments? Yeah, I would. You know, the people who are definitely when you're visiting your loved ones who might be on hospice. A big thing that I see is that people will they don't want to talk about it. Like you said, they're uncomfortable. So the mm -hmm. patient might try to talk about their upcoming death and they're like, well, I don't want to think about you dying and they change the subject, but we should let people talk about it if they want to. And I have heard that from patients where they're like, I feel kind of alone because no one wants to talk about my death with me. And mm -hmm. I really do want to talk about it. And so whenever those, con those uncomfortable conversations do come up, just let them have that space and don't try to change the subject lean into the discomfort with yeah. them. Okay. Is there something you think is important for, for the patient to hear from, from all of us? A lot of times I'll see patients hold on whenever they're very concerned about, um, mainly I'll see it, uh, like with the kids, like if they're the last parent alive and all the kids are fighting, um, I'll see them hold on because I think they're concerned about how they'll be. So if you can make amends and just tell your loved one, you know what, we're going to be okay. I promise, you know, we, we really are going to be okay. Um, I see that a lot where people are really worried about dying and leaving someone when they're, when they're not okay. So giving, giving that patient the permission to let go. Yes, exactly. Wow. 
Um, I, I, I heard that you have a, you're on a mission. You, you have a goal to create a not-for-profit to help, to help caregivers. Tell me about this. Yes. So I saw the gap, especially around here. I live near New Orleans. And a big gap that I see here with hospice houses, which the respite is something hospice offers where they'll pay for up to five days for you to go to what's called a respite care center. And they will, yeah, they'll pay for you for the caregiver to get a break um, instead of like going into a nursing home long term. The issue is, is that around here, at least, um, that it's usually in nursing homes and they don't allow the caregiver to stay. So unfortunately, respite is normally used near the end because that's when symptoms are harder to manage. Caregiving gets harder and most caregivers will not risk not being there for their loved one Mm -hmm. in their last five days of life. So they just, they just don't, they just refuse it and they're just completely burned out you know, in those last few days. So my goal is to open a nonprofit hospice house where caregivers are welcomed. They're given their own bed. They're given a warm meal and they're really taken care of. And the patient is as well, of course. So I would be, uh, make that clear for me. So I'm there with my patient, Mm -hmm. uh, with my, with my loved one, and I have a place to stay. So you're going to bring the hospice patient into this home, and then you're also welcoming in the caregiver to stay with them. Yes. And then my goal is that each patient gets a night where they can invite anyone they want, you know, their family, friends, whoever, sit around a big dining room table, everyone gets dinner, and there's toast to their life like a living funeral. Mm. Um, Instead of, I, I go to a lot of patient funerals, and I always sit there during the eulogies and think, my patient would have loved to hear this. And that that's really what I want to do. Do you have a GoFundMe or something like that set up yet? Can we can we support you in that way? Uh, thank you. So right now I am waiting on my 5013C status from the government. Um, it's a medical facility, so it's taken a little bit longer, but it's called Hadley House. Hadleyhouse.org is what I have set up right now so I can give updates on whenever I can take donations. Okay. Well, well, we'll definitely include a link to that in the show notes. This has got to have changed you. I know you, you grew up wanting to be a writer, so it's a dream come true for you. Hospice was something that you never imagined. Yes. How is your life different because of the, all this experience? It's been absolutely amazing, you know, through writing and social media. I've always taking care of, you know, my patients and their families. And, you know, at once I have about 10 patients and families at one time. And it's, I feel like I have a million patients and families now that I'm able to help and care for. And it's truly amazing to see how I can reach people beyond just who's the people whose homes I'm in every day. Tell me about the difference between empathy and sympathy and how you apply that in your world. Yeah, that was a hard one for me to learn, especially going into hospice, but it's so important. So sympathy is whenever you take on things like it's happening to you. So at first it was like every patient death was like I was losing, say, a grandparent and I was just feeling it like I just was this tremendous loss for me as well. And empathy is the ability to say, you know, I feel for these people and I know how it would be and I can provide compassionate care but this is not my loved one. And it is okay if I go home and enjoy spending time with my family. I don't need to go through an entire grief process like a family every yeah. single time. Yeah, that would be devastating. That would be impossible to manage. Yeah. So I'm guessing that a lot of what you do not only supports the patient, but everyone else in that household. You're, you really are providing care for everyone in that scenario. Yes, absolutely. And that's a big part of what we do and, and why I love hospice nursing. Tell me about that. What do you, how can, how, what makes it better for me as a family member around my, my, my relative who's passing away? Yeah, a lot of it is education since most people don't realize that the caregiver is the main provider of care in the end of life care. And a lot of it is, you know, me explaining, this is how you do this. Um, This is what to expect. I found it took me a couple of years to understand it because like you said, those uncomfortable conversations, but most people want to hear what is the worst thing that could possibly happen and Mm -hmm. be prepared. And they want to know 
every little thing that's going to come next. And so I'm always preparing them. This is what could happen next. This would be the worst case scenario. And this is what you do. Got it. You know, I know you've done a million interviews and now that your book is published, you're going to be doing a million more. Is there anything we didn't talk about you think people want to hear or need to hear? The only other thing I could think, especially for your audience, is a lot of people say, I don't know when the time for hospice care is. And they usually will just wait till there's like an ER event and the doctor says, okay, it's time to call. I think the best thing that you can do is your primary care physician they're, I think they're getting so much better over the last couple of years. But again, uncomfortable conversations, a lot of times they won't want to bring it up. So I think if you initiate that conversation and say, you know, whenever you think it's time for hospice, will you just let us know? Um, I think that that can be so important and they can let you know when it's time to refer. I have enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much for your Thank book. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hadley Vlahos is uh, online at, give us your address again, HadleyHouse.com? Yeah, HadleyHouse.org. Dot org. Okay, HadleyHouse.org. And the book is The In-Between, Unforgettable Encounters During Life's Final Moments. Great success, I hope, for you. Thank you so much.